Hi everyone, I'm Matteo Rebiondi, and in this video I'm going to show you how we implemented an object-oriented library for solving small and large-scale inverse problems. This is the collaboration of multiple people that started a few years ago. Probably you are wondering why not using existing libraries. For instance, we could have used MATLAB or SciPy, or if we had to invert a matrix, we could have simply used NumPy for doing that. However, we needed some sort of flexibility in defining our inverse problem, and you're going to see an application of that when we apply the variable projection method. Secondly, we had to have some kind of flexibility in saving the components of the inversion. And as much as it's true that most of our libraries, they have a callback function, sometimes, given the application you're considering, that function might be not optimal for the application you're doing. Finally, we had to have the library being able to handle large data set and be able to scale to a cluster without changing the existing code that much. The second question is which programming language should we use? We could have used Julia, C, C++, R, but given the raising popularity of Python, we decided to implement the library using it. And there are so many tools and modules already available to any user that actually was a very good choice. Before going through all the possible applications of the library, let's try to dissect an inverse problem and identify all the mathematical objects that we need. Let's consider these two problems, a linear and a nonlinear one. And as I said, let's try to identify all the possible things that we need within an inversion. First of all, we need some vector class so that we can actually define some quantities and handle data. Then we also need some operator that takes some vector and maps into another vector space. Once we have those two, we can actually define a problem that is going to be then passed to a solver object that uh, can minimize and find the argmin of it. OK, let's start with the vector class. What do we need the vector class to do? Once we have an instance of a vector, we possibly need to compute the norm, maybe add two vectors, possibly scale the vector by a scalar, and pretty often, uh, actually, if you run any inversion, you know that we need to compute the dot product of two vectors. This is, comes very often during an inversion. And possibly, in some cases, you also need to compute pointwise multiplication of the two vectors. And other few operations that are pretty, very basically, they come handy during an inversion. What should the operator class do? This is the second class that we're going to describe here. So for instance, when we pass an input vector x and an output vector y, we need to make sure that these two vectors are in agreement with the domain and range of the operator. Once we are sure about it, we can take the input vector and map into the output vector using the forward mapping. And if we're dealing with a linear operator, we need also the adjoint operation. And uh, actually, sometimes it's useful as you're de developing your code to make sure that your operator is actually adjoint between one another. And you can do that. There is a method within the operator class that you can use. Or in some other operations or methods that you can use, for instance, the power method to compute the eigenvalues of your operator. And what does the user need to define? Effectively, not that many things. Just the constructor and the forward mapping and a joint in case you, the user needs a linear operator. Now, once we have the operator and the vector class, we can actually define some problems. And what do we need out of the uh, problem class? Not that much. Basically, just compute the objective function value. And if you're using some gradient-based method, we just need to be able to compute the gradient of the problem. So now let's jump into the example, the most interesting part of this presentation. And let's start with some convex altitude norm problems. In this application, we're going to show you how to use the library to solve a least square RTM problem, basically least square reverse time migration problem. And basically, like we took the Marmuzi model, we smoothed it a little bit, took the difference between the true, and constructed the reflectivity shown here in the bottom. Once we have those, we can construct the Bohr modeling operator and map the true reflectivity into some data. And uh, why is this application interesting? It's because actually, when we bind some C++ code, that goes into CUDA, and so that all the propagation are performed within a GPU. Now that we have our data in our ball model operator, we can actually minimize, pose the inverse problem, and minimize it using a conjugate gradient. We run the conjugate gradient for 2,000 iterations, and we can see that we retrieve a pretty good uh, reflectivity. In fact, it 
we compute some kind of model matching, as you can see here on the right, you can see that we matched almost 80% of the true reflectivity. And if we go into a qualitative comparison, you can see that we are pretty close to the true reflectivity. Now that we know how to solve L2 problems, let's try and see if we can solve L1 problems in which we try to promote sparsity in the solution. In the first example, we're going to uh, test the iterative soft thresholding solver on a deep learning case. Here we took two spikes, M2, and we smoothed with uh, the Gaussian filter A and obtain the image D here shown on the left. If we solve the L2 norm problem, it's true that uh, we try to retrieve the energy close to the spikes, but the solution is suboptimal. On the other hand, if we solve and try to apply the iterative soft threshold to solve the problem shown here on the right, you can see the solution is way more sparser compared to the mid or panel. And here is interesting because actually like to create the A filter, we just use SciPy and bind it, if you may, or wrap the Gaussian filter into the operator class. Okay, in the second application of the L1 or sparsity promoting solvers, we're going to try some deconvolution or blocky deconvolution. In this case, we're going to take the blocky signal X and try to retrieve it out of the filter signal D, as you can see. Basically, it's just we applied some kind of Gaussian filter in this case to the blocky signal and we obtain some data. Before we go and show you the application of the L1, let's try to again to apply the L L2 and in this case instead of using linear conjugate gradient, we also have available LSQR that was proposed by Page and Saunders in 1982. And as you can see, the retrieve signal is not bad but it's far from being blocky as you can see. You can see that the reg retrieve signal it's pretty wiggly and it's as much as it's following the true signal, the black line, it's not exactly bulky. So instead, so in this case, instead we want to minimize or try to make the derivative of the signal sparse. And that's the reason why in the regularization term, we try to minimize the L1 norm of the derivative of the signal. And if we apply the split Bregman method, you can see that we retrieve the blocky signal pretty accurately. In fact, the red curve and the black curve are one on top of each other. Okay, now that we know we can solve L2 and L1 problems, let's try to solve a nonlinear L2 problem. And in this case, we're going to see two applications. In the first example, we're going to minimize the Rosenbrock objective function. Actually, it's a very important test. Whenever you code or test a nonlinear objective function minimizer, it's always good to test with this objective function. In fact, quoting Wikipedia, it says, the global minimum is inside a long, narrow parabolic shape valley. To find the valley is trivial, and actually most of the algorithm are going to find it. However, to convert to the global minimum is difficult. In fact, if we compare the application of uh, the various objective function minimizer, we can see that steepest defense after 500 iteration converges to the trivial valley, however, it fails to find the minimum indicated by the red circle. On the other hand, after 206 iteration, nonlinear conjugate gradient uh, successfully find the minimum. However, like the optimal or the ideal minimizer or solver is BFGS. In fact, after 26 iteration, it finds the minimum without any problem. And instead, if we limit the number of steps that we save, in this case 10, using the limited memory BFGS, we get the minimum after 30, but still a pretty good method to use whenever we're dealing with nonlinear objective function. Let's move to a more interesting application or a more geophysical application. In this case, we're going to solve the full reform inversion problem using the Marmuzi model. In fact, we took the Marmuzi model, the true model shown here on the left, and generate some data. And in this case, we use the same approach that we took before for the least square RTM problem, in which we basically had all the wave equation operators coded in CUDA, in which we took the Python code and binded with C++ using PyBind11. And here we're minimizing just the L2 norm difference of the model data, f of m, starting with the model shown here in red, the initial model here. And we just minimize the difference with the observed data d, the blue d here. We invert using BFGS, and we run BFGS for 400 iteration. 
as you can see on the left, the inverted model is pretty good in pretty good agreement with the true model, if I show you the true model here, which is pretty encouraging, sh showing you that okay, like we took the same library from a very simple application minimizing the uh, Rosenbach objective function, and we apply the same exact code to solve this more complicated example in which we were actually doing uh, uh, PDE solutions. Now let's move on and show you a more interesting application of the library in which we actually combine some linear solver with a non-linear solver. In fact, I'm going to show you why we needed to do so. And in this case, we're going to use the variable projection method. This method was developed or invented, if you may, by Golub and Pereira in 1973. And it's an efficient method to solve non-linear separable least square problem. And the problem is, is stated like this. We have two vectors. Basically, we have one part of the problem that is non-linear or defined as a non-convex objective function when you fix m. And in the other case, when we fix the non-linear part, we define a linear problem with respect to m. And uh, this problem, actually, as showed by Golub and Pereira and many others, is pretty uh, important, if you may, to transform into the following one, in which basically like we, for every single non-linear uh, point, we find the optimal linear part. And I'm going to show you how we, it works, actually, with a very simple example. In fact, if we take this very simple example in which we have an exponential fitting, we, have, we just need to find two parameters, A and B, out of some observed data. Here I fix some data, and I show you basically an extensive search with respect to the two parameters, a and b. And you can see the minimum is around 10 and 1 in the, this case. So we can just start an optimization method, for example, like in this case, BFGS, out of the case 0 and 2. And it finds the minimum, no question about it. But is there a better way to find the minimum? And actually, there is. One trick that we can play, we can apply the variable projection. And in this case, for every single b, we computed the optimal value of a. And in this case, very simple. It's given by just solving this, the objective function whenever we uh, fix b. And effectively, this is actually a very powerful method because now we reduce the problem to one single variable. And effectively, we extract the objective function on log that dotted or dashed uh, red curve. And this is the actual problem that we're solving. So we started with a bidimensional or b-dimensional problem, and we now have one-dimensional problem where the, it's clear that the minimum is at 1. And it's actually very efficient, and the, you find the minimum way faster than using BFGS on the original problem. The same exact implementation of the variable projection method that was applied to solve the very simple example that I showed you before was also applied to solve full waveform inversion by model extension. This is a method that was proposed by Guillaume and I in 2018, in which we tried to minimize or mitigate all the cycle skipping issues of FWI. In this problem, we have to minimize the following objective function. f of m indicates just the nonlinear wave equation operator. Again, the same one that we applied in FWI that I explained before. b tilde, p tilde is just some data raising from the application of b tilde, which is extended Bohr modeling operator applied to an optimal perturbation, p tilde opt. And p tilde is interesting because this is where the variable projection comes in, which is the solution of an extended least square RTM problem. So every single time we change the background model or we change the M, we have to find the solution of this uh, linear problem. D indicates the true data that have been generated using the Marmuzi model. So we're going to see the Marmuzi model at the end. Does not contain any low frequency or any frequency below 4 hertz. In this problem, we start the inversion using a very naive initial model, which is shown in the bottom, and it's just a V of Z. We run the inversion, we apply the variable projection implementation that we have, and this is the inverted model that we retrieve. And as you can see, it's pretty close to the true model. In fact, if I show you the true model, you can see that uh, they're not that very, they're not very different qualitatively. We showed you the application of the library on three different cases where we applied, if you may, a common gradient-based optimization method. And here we would like to show you the fact that the library can also be used to perform global optimization. And in this case, you're going to see preliminary result of Markov change Monte Carlo method, or MCMC. Here we would like to extract samples out of a given probability density function, or PDF. 
In this example, we're going to use the sum of two multivariate Gaussian distribution. And if we perform an extensive search, we can actually plot it. And you can see that the two Gaussians are well separated from one another. Now the question is, can MCMC extract samples that follow this probability density function? And if we compute an histogram or a 2D histogram, normalized histogram of the extracted sample, we can see that the, the histogram follows pretty well, actually, the probability density function that uh, we gave ourselves, meaning the MCMC seems to be able to extract samples that are following the probability density function that we are trying to sample. Now it comes a very important question that we have to answer. Can we apply the same exact library to solve a problem that has to run on a cluster, for instance, when we have to apply the library on 3D real data set? And the answer is yes, we actually changed the vector and operator classes to employ Dask. In fact, Dask is a pretty powerful Python library that takes Python codes that runs on your local machine and scales it up so that you can run it on a cluster. Let me describe to you how the Dask vector class works. So basically we can take a given vector, split it into chunks, just like here, and then spread those chunks onto different workers or different machine. For instance, let's consider the inversion of a 3D real seismic survey. For example, we could have 4,000 time samples, basically corresponding to 8 seconds at 2 millisecond sampling, and we have 2,000 receivers and 35,000 sources. This corresponds to roughly 280 billion elements, or simply more than one terabyte of memory. Obviously, we cannot store this huge vector onto a single machine, so we have to spread it onto different workers. And the code to do so is very simple. In fact, we can start a task client. In this case, we have 15 workers. Decide the size of a single chunk, how many chunks we have. In this case, we have six chunks per worker. And then allocate the vector, as you can see here in the last line. If you look at the desk dashboard, you can see that actually the memory allocated is roughly 1.12 terabytes here on the top left. Now that we saw how the desk vector class works, let's see the desk operator. So we have our desk vector where each chunk stays on each worker, and we can call it just M. And we want to see how we can transform it using a, a operator, for instance. So one thing that we can do, and it's very simple, we can just instantiate different operators on different workers. And once we do so, we can apply each operator on different chunks and obtain a new vector. So basically, we transform the entire vector M using the operator A. To test the scalability of the desk operator class, we decided to take the wave equation nonlinear operator that uh, was used in the FWA case that I showed you before and see what kind of speed up we can uh, obtain using multiple nodes. Here in this graph, I'm showing you the number of nodes employed during the test versus the speed up factor. And as you can see, ideally, we would like to get a, a linear speed up, meaning a 45 degrees line showed you here with the blue line. And uh, the observed one instead is uh, described by the dash red curve. And as you can see, it's almost linear, meaning we almost obtain a linear speed up factor in this case, which is pretty encouraging. The library is part of a Git repo that can be downloaded at the link showed in this slide. And in the repo, you're going to see some notebooks that uh, can be used to reproduce some of the examples that I showed you in this presentation. If you have any uh, question or comment, please email me at ettore88 at stanford.edu. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.